Hey, welcome. Yes, We Rise listeners, really excited to have Marie-Ellen Peltier on our show today. Uh, thanks so much for joining MH. Will you please introduce yourself so folks know who I have the delight of speaking to? And my delight as well to speak with you, Christine. Um, so yes, full name is Marie-Hélène Peltier, uh, originally from uh, Quebec on the East Coast in Canada. I now live on the West Coast in Vancouver, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. I'm a registered psychologist uh, and I've worked in workplace mental health my entire career. I have a combination of uh, the psychology background, so I've got a PhD there, and the business background, so the MBA, and I've worked in leadership for years. So that's uh, sort of the perspectives that I bring together in my uh, work on resilience. Wonderful. Tell us a little bit more about why those two arms. So often those two things go hand in hand, but why business and psychology together, the MBA? Uh, for me personally, you mean it? Oh, tell us about what, what drew you to the work and, and, and why this topic for you? Yes, yes. It, it's a, probably a combination of me personally and mm -hmm how they, they wanted to go together, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and But for me personally, the way it happened um, is that, so I did my PhD uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the research I was doing was, um, it was tying to co even community resilience in a way, because I was um, exploring the efficacy of providing psychotherapy via video conferencing. But then 20 years ago, remember, internet was not fast enough to deliver that kind of data. So I had to use six telephone lines to transmit video and, mm -hmm. and audio data. And therefore, I needed a lot of funding to manage this type of research. I needed to hire people that I had to just manage from not even having money to pay them, just volunteer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of management of people and money was involved in doing this type of research. Mm -hmm. And so as that completed, I looked at what I was passionate about, and I was still passionate about psychologists, psychology and bringing psychology to as many people as I could. And I became passionate about business. Mm -hmm. So that's what brought me to doing um, an MBA. Uh, and then the combination worked very well for bringing, um, for, for this work that I did in, in workplace mental health. So I could understand how organizations need to work and how individuals in them function. So I'm not an organizational psychologist. I'm a mm -hmm. critical and counseling psychologist. Mm -hmm working in workplaces and, and with leadership. That's how I got to it. But of course, it made sense because the people I was working with, it sometimes I've been called a translator and not just French to English or, in, or the, the other, but translating psychology to business and business to psychology such that we can play in that intersection and all benefit from it. Yeah, wonderful. And, and it intersects in so many areas of our life, of course, and applies to our personal scale. Tell us a little bit about really what's exciting you about your research, MH, and your work, you know, with people with their own individual mental health, organizational uh, well-being, and how has that arc changed over the last few years? Ah, uh, many. There's many things I love about mm -hmm. this. Um, well, okay, so you know, psychologists counseling and clinical psychologists will tend to be more focused on the individual, which is wonderful. There's a lot, a lot that we can do here. It, for me, bringing this and the business background together in my individual experience as, as a leader here really um, expanded perhaps um, where I wanted to contribute in, in including the individual resilience, but also the team resilience within an organization or a structure, any kind. Um, and then the overall organization, even sometimes I go even broader to say, and, and all this, like the individual, the team, the organization, we are in this place, we are in this country, we're in this moment in time that also will influence that system. Right? Mm -hmm. And that, um, um, that became very fascinating for me so that uh, we could be even more overall together, powerful and increasing resilience if we attended to the various parts of that system as opposed to more the individual one, which again, mm. very important and valuable, lots we can do here and even more if we act at, at different levels. Absolutely. So one of the things that I've really appreciated in the, so we do a lot of work around resilience and really at the community scale of resilience. And as we were chatting earlier before we started recording, how that community scale resilience changes over time. I heard a conversation on a Brene Brown interview um, 
that the guest said that resilience is really only built in community. And in the last few years, there's been quite a bit of pushback to some degree about resilience. And I think that that comes in the individual scale and the expectation that people need to continue to be resilient in the face of insurmountable systemic systemic racism, for example. That is a collective scale issue that really takes a collective scale response. And so I love this notion that resilience is really built at the community scale or the collective scale because it really is a shared learning. And, and I think we also often look at resilience in our work around not just bouncing back, but bouncing forward. You know, what does that resilient future look like? So when you talk about those different parts that go into a system, what are some of the levers that you find that need to be moved to create that community scale resilience or organizational resilience or collective resilience? What do you see really needs to shift beyond just the individual scale, recognizing the importance, as you've said, MH, of the individual scale, but really looking as a system as a whole? I know. And uh, to, to the first point, just before I, I dive into mm -hmm. the levers, it's a great, uh, I'm glad, glad that you brought this up. You know, sometimes uh, uh, one of the um, um, analogies that have been used to describe the situation you're referring to is that of how um, coal mines used to have a canary going in a coal mine. And if canary was coming back, it was safe enough. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the analogy uh, has been, and many have used it, I'm not the one inventing it, uh, was, oh, well, if we're doing individual resilience, are we not just trying to make the canary tougher mm -hmm. so the canary will still go in the mine that is unhealthy mm -hmm. and but tough it out? Can mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. I both love and don't love this analogy, and I'll tell you why. I love it because it makes the point so clearly about how this is a system. It's not just individual. Okay, so love that part. What I don't love is that we're not a bird. You know, there are many ways we will influence this. And if we're going to talk about the systemic, the team and the organizational resilience, we can only influence team and organizational resilience if we have enough resilience ourselves individually if we've got enough in the tank right so that's why we don't want to throw the baby with you know too quickly we want to just take a step back look at what is what what fits where and integrate all aspects okay so that's my my piece about that conversation which i think is an important one and i love that we're having it mm -hmm. in terms of levers it will depend on each context of course but some of the in so we can dive into examples of context or examples of challenges, perhaps. Um, but initially, we, it, it depends very much. So I'll give examples of um, potential scenarios. Um, in a scenario where very little is currently being done, people are either very focused on the technical part, on the to-do list or whatever, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a journey, a continuous journey, regardless of where we're at. But if um, a team or an organization is very early, then the ways we're going to influence it often, in my experience, um, are going to be finding the very small ways in which it's already happening, finding the champion, finding the small actions and putting air on this so that it, it grows. It's like a flame. Now we air it and it becomes much bigger because then people will see it more. People will get attracted to it more. If we're, especially as a leader, anyone can do this because we can all influence. And the leader is usually the one that will have even more impact if they throw air on that flame, right? Because then they're sending a clear message that in this culture, the culture of this team, the culture of this organization, we value this. Mm -hmm. And then that shows everyone mm -hmm. how um, important this is. So in a context early, that's often a good way to get it started. It won't work all the time. It won't be perfect. It, there will be bumps, all these things, normal. Mm -hmm. But then we want to be persistent and keep finding these paces, keep bringing the air. So in a, in a, um, an, a place that's a bit earlier in the process, that's one thing I would be lo uh, looking to do. Um, and in in a context that has already done some of these things, we're 
seeing more and more, then we're probably ready to get uh, a bit more organized around it, um, like building a plan. Sometimes people like to use the word strategy if that's how the organization thinks. Um, if that's not the, the word that is preferred, maybe just a plan, it doesn't matter. It's, it all means the same thing. The idea is to now start looking at recognizing what we have, which is also a, a, something to celebrate and, you know, and value, and then building on, okay, so what do we want to do next? And when and how we're going to get there? What types of actions will bring these, um, these directions to life? So then I would go more strategic in that, uh, in that type of context. I love that. Yeah, great example. And so it's fascinating you brought up the canary in the coal mine example. A lot of the work that we do is focused actually in coal mining communities, particularly in central Appalachia. And I think that's an interesting example of communities who have had um, a lot of the natural wealth as well as economic wealth of the communities ha have left in various ways, whether that's been through wages that have left or the, re the natural resources that have left. And, and so there's a different set of opportunities and challenges for building that initial resilience. To bring it back to the individual scale, can you talk a little bit about what you mean when you talk about individual resilience? How do people build that? And then at the organizational or community scale, what are the things that are really helpful to put in place so that people can even look ahead to create that strategy or plan or vision, if you will, that's so essential. And, and we definitely believe that everyone has the ability to come to the table, that resilience is built on the local ideas of local leaders. That's something we talk about a lot and that people do have the you know, wisdom within them innately to be able to guide their futures. That's something we absolutely believe, but sometimes even just getting to the table can be challenging for some people. So can you talk a little bit about that individual scale of resilience and then what is helpful at that system scale resilience to be able to really look ahead to the future? Yes, yes, um, really good question. And so I'll start with the individual, but mm -hmm. please bring me back to the mm -hmm. um, having a hard time to getting to the table. I re really wanna make sure we touch on this. Um, and sometimes I get, uh, you know, mm, sure. far in my ideas over here and I forget this one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, on the individual uh, scale, you're right. I love how you expressed this, that we have the the wisdom already on the, on the things, the actions, the choices that would likely increase our resilience. And you're right. If we look back, and I often invite my audiences, my clients to think about this. If you do look back 5, 10, 20 years over just your life quickly, even now, like in 10 seconds, mm -hmm. the kinds of things you've done that have generally increased your resilience, people will breathe and take a moment and then identify, oh, yeah, I used to do this. Mm -hmm. I used to play the guitar, not touched it, don't even know where it is. Mm -hmm. um, it, things like this that then will bring come back to the surface and we've let it go. So I would say that very often the main thing that's missing is the the clarity the commitment of prior prioritizing it putting it as a priority mm -hmm. french language mm -hmm. um so making bringing it first creating space for it um it's as if people will look at their overall life if i can if you can imagine that full rectangle half of it is work and it's full so it's all colored and then the ha other half is my personal life so it's mm -hmm. all open and then people will then sometimes see that they have so much more work or they're asked or whatever, and then they'll start working here during their what I call personal time, mm -hmm. which means it will push those boundaries, those, those times you were trying to protect for your uh, own resilience. So my invitation on something like this is to change this, color fully the full personal life here. It's full, whether you're needing it to watch a TV show or go for a longer walk with your dog or with someone you enjoy or on your own in the nature. Consider the whole thing occupied mm -hmm. so that when you're making a choice to bring work on the personal side, it will hopefully help you keep in mind that you're putting something else aside as a result. Mm -hmm. It was not just open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the priority is important. And in terms of what you do in this time, there's lots of research about a number of areas, but the four that are possibly the, the most 
um, powerful variables in building this resilience and not just our resilience. It, it's also true for our physical health, actually, and brain health. So, so even if you're seeing yourself as someone who's working more with your brain, potentially, it still applies. So we want exercise and we do want like physical activity. We want cardio, strength training and meditative type activity, all three on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Um, we want good nutrition. And I know it sounds like, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's not just, oh, yeah, yeah. The research, the growing research. And I was recently as at a talk between the American Psychological Association, the American Nutrition Association, showing that the strength of these links and the, the how fast we will feel it is significant. So, yes, nutrition, uh, sleep and spending time with people we enjoy spending time with. And that last one is a really good example. Very often people will say, yes, I will do this. I will plan for a moment with a very good friend or someone I've not connected with. And as things get busy, they cancel. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying, what we're saying mm -hmm. is we need this. Mm -hmm. Shift your thinking. Consider it like mm -hmm. an appointment that you've made six months ago with a specialist that you have to keep. You would keep it. You would figure out a way. That same way. That's how important. That's how mm -hmm. top of the list this needs to be. And there are many others, like time in nature, doing volunteer work. There are many others as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are some examples on the individual front. Mm -hmm. Should I turn to the yes, organization? Please. Yeah. Now remind me. So it was like people having at times a hard time getting to the table so we can discuss. Well, I think it's. Yes, I think that's part of it. That connects to the individual scale. What really helps people know that their voice has value and meaning, and it's almost a hmm, an inner worth, knowing that their inner worth is part of the collective and comes together. So it does relate to the individual scale. But really what helps communities be able to move from that place of, okay, here we're together, to being able to plan for the future. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, part of what I'm thinking as I'm listening is that, and in in fairness, these are large, complex, mm -hmm. system systemic type situations, which will, just like the individuals are so different in their contexts, and, and that's why it needs to be customized, uh, which is part of what my book is about. I've got a book coming out in February. Oh, okay. I don't, and it's I'm exactly about, about that. this. Great. <laughs> but um, but the point is. The, the key piece, the key word here is context, mm -hmm. because sometimes we try to apply generic things and we're having generic things, generic uh, guidelines, mm -hmm. and um, either they don't work, they, we don't apply them, or we try, it doesn't work. It's often a problem of not having adapted them to the context. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely true on the personal individual side. It's also extremely true on the systemic side, mm -hmm. right? It's similar, and that is an analogy I have uh, in my book there, but it's, right, from a pure business perspective, if an organization is, whatever, working on whatever their mission is, mm -hmm. they will, for sure, look at the context. They won't just say, oh, let's provide this service mm -hmm. and just go and try to provide it. They'll look around, they'll, they'll assess what else is going on already in this context, where are the gaps, what are we going to bring differently, like, context is front and center. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to let that go because now we're talking about resilience. It's exactly the same thing that will help us move it forward. So all this to say that if we're having a hard time moving things forward, then, and I love how you, you're tying also sometimes how it feels personal at times, like, you know, it's like mm -hmm. I've tried so much and now it's not working. So I could feel like my value is coming down. Bring an element, that's why I bring the psychology side here, we need to manage our brains. Mm -hmm. It's normal that the brain um, assigns us a bit of that or a lot of that responsibility because often the reaction is in a tough moment, taking responsibility allows us to, it's not actual, but it feels like we have some control over it. But we actually don't, it's a system, it's not, it's not all in our hands. So on the personal side, what sometimes one of very concrete ways I'll, I'll say it is I'll say, look, yes, you just had this meeting or you've been trying to do this for a month, a year, three years, doesn't matter. Your 
your person, your value as a person, as a professional, as whatever you are, seriously, if we took a thermometer today and three years ago, you're the same person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no change in that value. You need to keep, you need to really force yourself to remind this so that you keep that sense of self-worth, integrity, and confidence. Mm -hmm. And realize, again, very realistically and logically that you're working with a big system here. And so, yes, you can bring your influence, look for all the ways and persist while taking care of yourself because there are sometimes are limits to how much one can try. But if you're still in it and, and you're working towards it, keep that realistic perspective. You're working to influence, but the system has to want to go too. Mm -hmm. It's not all in your hands. So I hear both at the individual scale and at the system scale. And and sometimes it's it's looking around and seeing what's out there. So yeah. to bring it back to the individual scale for a moment, I love that you name the things that we know, but that we often don't elevate as just being absolutely essential. And the word precious came to my mind. You talked about, you know, the example of meeting with a, a specialist, but exercise, nutrition, sleep, and spending time with people that we love or care about. What are some factors at the organizational scale or some examples of businesses that have helped them become the most successful or resilient? What are, what are some ways that you've really just seen organizations flourish? Yes, yes, yes. You want to look at um, factors that allow, one of the ways sometimes to think about this is you're looking at factors that will optimize the supply of energy and what's in, you know, um, increasing it and also optimize how we're managing the demands, right? That's the overall direction. So examples of this could include increasing influence. Mm -hmm. So if say you're a team leader and um, we're wanting to increase resilience overall, maybe you've taken it on your shoulders to make decisions and propose and move things forward. How about you step back a little bit mm -hmm. and increase the influence of the team? Even if you have ideas, keep in mind, and you know, most leaders will agree with me, the team will come up with even better ideas regardless. Mm -hmm. So um, purely logistically, it's a good idea. But from a resilience perspective, now people are involved. Mm -hmm. And as people are involved, they're developing their technical term is self-efficacy, the belief that we can influence this. Mm -hmm. And when we're increasing self-efficacy, we're increasing optimism. We're increasing agency. Oh, okay. Now that sounds, that's start, starting to feel um, very strong, positive, and engaging. So that's one example. Um, another example may be to actually step back and look at the workload. And it's a tough topic because often people tell me, there's nothing we can do about the workload. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. And my invitation for having done it personally, having worked with others, I've seen it enough that it's really worth exploring. We're not looking at changing 80% of that workload, mm -hmm. obviously. We want to keep in mind that sometimes a small shift will have a large influence. Mm -hmm. And so, and at times it may mean to get very specific about, okay, concretely, MH, with, like how <laughs> would you do this? Okay, it could be as um, um, simple as, it's not simple, as um, um, objective as sitting with the team and saying, okay, we're all involved in this process. Where is the moment where it's most challenging? And the team will know. It's not the first few steps, it's step number three. That's what, that's when it's like, oh, I don't want to do it. It, it extends forever. It doesn't go well. Oh. So now we found where the, the biggest challenge is. Let's put the microscope on this and look for ways to make it a bit better, more whatever it needs, and whether it's more efficient. Let's, let's wait on just one person or a different way of handling, handling whatever is challenging about it. So we've taken the time to get in it mm -hmm. and change it. And that sometimes will change the workload. Mm -hmm. So we want to, these are some examples of ways in which we can help bring that resilience, even overall psychological health mm -hmm. uh, in the organization, which then allows us to talk more about the challenges, mm -hmm. 
when we make mistakes, bring them up sooner and know that they'll be, yeah, we'll we'll fix them, but we'll also learn about with with from this experience. And then what we're doing is we're we're building a, a culture that's even more compassionate, mm -hmm. where we're using a growth mindset. So not everything's perfect, but when something's not working, we're learning from it. And you see how all these things nourish how we approach these challenges, which in the end will keep and nourish higher results, even from an individual perspective, which translates in teams. There are many other ways, but these are some examples of approaches. Yeah, great example. So I hear um, stepping back, really looking, you know, where are the opportunities and challenges, um, giving breath and space for that self-efficacy you talked about, for recognizing that individual optimism and agency, and then within teams to really look more broadly, particularly where there are challenges, at where are those most challenging moments, and then to give them some space and air and breath a little bit, it sounds like, to identify you know, explore what opportunities are, that growth mindset you talked about um, to being able to continue to learn from challenges. What other factors do you find really help grow the resilience within organizations um, for the long term? Are there factors that really help businesses or organizations be more resilient or flourish over multiple years when you have, uh, you know, it's, it's a different time yeah. scale than short term work to some yeah. degree. Yes, and and what one of the it, one of the best ways to approach it again is to think of it as a, a resilient a, a, a strategy. Basically, you need to build it as a plan and a plan over years. Mm -hmm. And and what what organizations have done is create a plan, actions within the main pillars, and I'll give you an example in a second. Um, and then you measure how that's going and you evolve it over time. So you want, it's important to keep in mind that especially it's a bit true on the individual scale. It's not because we do one thing for ourselves this morning that we're now changed for the next two years, mm -hmm. right? It's a long-term investment. It needs to be adjusted, that kind of thing. The same logic applies here. And also over here in the business, it's the same you would approach the launch of a new service or a new project, right? So so we want to, to do that. So I'll give you an example, right? So an organization may say, okay, we very much want to improve the resilience and the overall psychological health of our employees. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways, uh, or team members, uh, and one of the ways we're going to do this is make sure that they are aware of the supports they have access to. And, and so then the actions maybe really talk about the types of resources we have access to um, mention it on quarterly meetings so that they know that as a culture, we support getting outside help, for example. That may be an example. OK, so then let's say this is part of their plan and they go and do this. Then they reevaluate, say, six months or a year down the road on how that's going. They may learn that, in fact, people have increased their use. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. They may also see that no one is using these services. Mm -hmm. They're not. They've talked about it, but no one, no one is. Mm -hmm. So then they may explore what what is this about? Is this that in this culture, even if we know it's there, we don't believe that it's okay. We will be seen as weak, for example. So then that organization may say, all right, in which ways can we change that part of our culture? And I've seen it before where this, this specific example I have in mind decided to create a peer support program within the organization where peers were connecting with each other about their challenges, talking about these resources, but now the link was made. And that's what worked for them. So that's just a, a small example of how, to your point, yes, we need to look at this over time. And we need to look at um, evaluating how that's going at our particular context and adapt um, based on this. It needs, it's a very much, it's alive. Mm -hmm. It needs to evolve over time. Yeah. And grounding it, whatever the situation may be, finding out like what the needs are. I love that example of the peer support because then it's it's really understanding what people need at the individual scale and finding out what collective resources are available, but then being able to ground it. So switching gears a little bit, tell us about your your book. Tell us about what you're excited about your book and and 
and yeah, what to expect with it? Ah, well, it's basically, it's bringing the, my two loves, <laughs> psychology and business together. Um, and, and it is, however, this book is for the individual over here. And I am explaining my position on the overall context still here. Um, it, but this book is focused here. There is a chapter about team resilience still because it, that's, again, it is a system. You mm -hmm. can't get away from that. Wow. My, uh, but the focus here is to help you, right? Professionals, leaders that give so much of themselves, the people you work with, give so much of themselves. Uh, and at times, whether it's because they're passionate or they see themselves as extremely strong already, mm -hmm. they will actually not invest as much here. And that puts them at risk um, of lower resilience, burnout even. And, and yet, if they build a strategy, a plan for themselves, doesn't need to be complicated. I'm not a complicated person. I will very straightforward. But there are ways to make sure realistic, doable ways that will then protect you and allow you to catch it faster and stay fabulous. Mm -hmm. So that, that. Uh, that's what this book's about. So, so I'll bring it into my own life a little bit as an example. So I've been working in the field of conflict resolution and planning for over 20 years at this point. And it's very busy. I love my work. I love the clients. I love the communities we serve. But, you know, like many people in, uh, in COVID, you know, I'm, I'm collectively just myself, the collective work we're doing, just feeling tired and, yeah. and hitting that edge. I wouldn't say burnout. But it's one of the first times that I've hit this point, maybe the second time in my professional career, where I just feel tired. And the things that you mentioned, you know, exercise, nutrition, sleep, spending time with those I love are, are things I really prioritize. Yet, when uh, things are really busy, it's easy to let those things slide a little bit. So what are some buffers that you found that yeah. people can put into place to, um, you know, so there is the pause, there is just simply taking a pause from things and recentering, regrounding, just taking time for yourself. But what are ways that people can work with the edge of burnout? And then again, I'm being intentional about not saying burnout, but just saying, hmm, I'm feeling a little tired. What is what does that look like? Uh, and and. I can guarantee you so many of your listeners are nodding as you're asking <laughs> right, this question. I, right, I, I, right. I know. I just know. Uh, and, and me too, right? It's uh, We've all experienced it. it and, and we will. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing. Resilience is not a personality trait. It's something that goes up and down through our lives. So, uh, and that's the positive side of this is that that means we can influence it. Mm -hmm. To your question. Yes, exactly. That's I work exclusively with people exactly like this. Mm -hmm. It's full, the plate is full. We value it, but there's just no time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the short answer is the less you feel like investing in this, the less you feel like exercising, the more you feel like, no, I just need to sit down, the more it means you need to go. Mm -hmm. so it's almost like a one plus one equals two. You know you should, you really don't feel like it, go. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, Ugh. and mm -hmm. And sometimes people... Um, very understandably, we'll say, well, but I so don't feel like it. It can't be what I need to do. I need to like listen to myself. In this case, no, behavior comes first. The behavior yes. will flip things. We don't want to wait to feel like it because as you were waiting to feel like it, we're not doing it and we're going further down. Mm -hmm. So you have to push the behavior mm -hmm. and you can say, I'm doing it, but I don't want to do it. Doesn't matter what you're telling yourself in your head. In this case, go. Okay, so the behavior first in this situation. And then you might say, yes, yes, but MH, I still don't have time. How am I going to do this? Okay, then you scale it. So if you're usual, and the recommended is often half an hour of exercise, right? Five times a week. Okay, so if you cannot do uh, half an hour, um, and plus, number one, before, let me step back for a quick sec. Mm -hmm. When you make your plan of in because again context so in christine's life right now are we going to try if let's say you're exercising zero right now no physical activity whatsoever we're absolutely not going to put in your plan to do five times a week half an hour mm -hmm. I, now it makes no sense mm -hmm. we would want to build gradually so let's say gradually let's start let's say you're right now at zero you used to maybe but recently nothing is happening 
So maybe a realistic plan is that you will go for two walks of 10 minutes per week. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's say this is the plan. And now you try to implement this plan. But let's say you get to the day where it's supposed to be your 10 minutes and it's so busy, you believe you cannot do 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. I'll leave it at that for right now, but let's say that's the state. Then I would say, put your shoes on and go for two minutes. Step outside. If you really cannot walk at all, step outside, breathe for one minute, come back in. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're not going to have the benefit of having done cardio work for half an hour. Mm -hmm. But what you have done, you're doing it at this point, not for the physical reason. You're doing it for the psychological reason. This then, what it does, a number of things, but one of the things is that it maintains the habit. Mm -hmm. That in itself has value. It also sends a message to yourself that you're keeping this at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. We're making an exception. It's not going to be as long as usual or the plan, but we're still keeping it there. And these things over time allow you to continue to build as opposed to stagnating and then Mm -hmm. uh, going in the other direction. So that these are ideas that would come to mind on this. That's great. I love that. So keeping it as a habit, keeping it on the list. And also I hear the importance of the, you know, our thoughts are real, but they're not necessarily true. One of my um, mindfulness yeah, teachers, you know, I love Tara Brock says that. So even though we might have the thought, we don't need to follow it. We just know it's something that we do for our own well-being. It's something we prioritize and we just make happen. Um, and, and absolutely the importance of exercise, even for our kiddos, you know, I often say, you just need to go. You know, you might not feel like it, but you just need to go outside. Go, go run That's right. On. That's not how we're made. We don't, Absolutely. it's just like if you decided to say, well, I'm not going to give electricity or, or gas to my, my car. You may or may not feel like it. However, it will not go anywhere if you don't. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Habits. Absolutely. And I love, you absolutely love the piece that you just said uh, about children, whether it's our own or others around us. Anytime we say, I've made myself go for a walk, even if I didn't feel like it, they learn. There, that's a message that gets into their brain. And so that's uh, in, you know, even in the overall communities we're in, that's that's part of what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. And so when people have found that point of they've fallen away from some of the habits they know that really help build their health, resilience, and well-being, when they've started to reestablish those, what really helps them move into, you know, beyond resilience to flourishing? I think those two things come hand in hand, resilience and flourishing, but really what helps keep people in that optimal state that can Uh, be, you know, generative. I know. And it's a, I do talk in very much in these, this direction uh, in the book, because it, it does connect with our overall context. And in this case, that also includes our values, mm. right? what we value personally. And that's a, a key component of how you're going to get to a plan or a strategy here that feels like yours feels like you want to do it because then if you do that and I actually have someone who came to a book related workshop last year as I was writing the book um, and then I ended up <laughs> giving that workshop in her organization uh, for her team of leaders and so she attended the, the thing twice basically but three months apart and she was reflecting on how at, when you make Uh, When you create your own plan like this, and it feels so much like yours, and it's absolutely realistic, doable, aligned with your values and your context, right? All these pieces that otherwise, if we just try to follow outside guidelines, sometimes it's challenging. So if it's very much yours, you will do it, Mm -hmm. and you will see the benefits, and then you can keep growing. And that's what happened for her. She did that, implemented the plan because it was so doable. Mm -hmm. When she found herself here... She was like, oh, my God, I really need to, I'm ready to change my plan. Mm. I've implemented this. I'm now turning myself to the next thing. It was so energizing, exactly, for her. Because, yes, the values tend to be stable. The things we value tend to be similar uh, in time. Um, But the context is different. So what's next for me? And then you get to plan that. And that in itself is extremely energizing. Mm -hmm. That's right. So those values stay consistent for us, but I hear yeah. that the you know we have the ability to plan, to grow, and iterate and adapt over time to be able to continue to keep things fresh and and really what's going to continue to build energy for us. So I love yes. this. 
So to, to move into, you know, the last part of our conversation, I want to bring some quick roller questions and a little bit more about you. You know, I, I've, um, to draw to this, I've really learned to prioritize the things that bring me joy as a way to build that energy and to focus on the things that bring me joy as a key way to continue to have the juice to do the work and all the good things in the world, whether that's personal or professional. So I, I love this question. Um, and, and tell us a little bit, MH, about what brings you joy in your life. Yes. Many things bring me joy, but one of them is uh, to be in the mountains. I uh, very much enjoy being in nature in general, but in mountains specifically, love that. And then you might say, but you can't be in the mountains all the time, MH, surely. No, very often I'm not. I'm in a city somewhere. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, however, and that's the thing, right? Sometimes we think of what brings us joy and then versions of it so yeah a version of it can be attending to one of those plants literally there are real plants here and that's a big deal for me i used to not be very good with that but yes or it can be when i go for a walk outside my outside in this specific uh, location is not a mountain Mm -hmm. however it's fresh air and the air smells differently today from yesterday and i enjoy that and so looking for versions of it, but mountains would have to be the top of that. Yeah, I love that. Mountains are so fabulous. And and finding what you can relate to in the moment while still keeping that bigger element of what brings you joy essential. And and we've talked about this a little bit, but what keeps you moving forward on the days you struggle? Uh, probably my passion for doing uh, what I do and also my um, confidence in the influence that I can have to change, you know, that particular um, situation. So let's say there's just lots of demands happening at the same time, or I've had to compromise on how much physical activity I could do. I know it will come back. It's just a moment where it got compressed for this, but tomorrow it's changing. Okay. So it's expanding perhaps the perspective, Mm -hmm. keeping where I'm going, and expanding the perspective to remind myself, okay, no, 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 right now it, we had to scale it down significantly. It's coming right back tomorrow so that uh, it will be there for me. And and it is. That bigger pr- perspective as a whole, absolutely. So what key lessons learned would you share with others who are trying to create change within themselves or their organizations or communities? Yes, I think I, I would say stay curious i'm gonna go with that Mm -hmm. curious because if we are curious we're looking we're gonna see things hear feel realize link and 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 it's through that creativity that sometimes we'll find solutions that we didn't see yesterday we didn't see earlier today Mm -hmm. but if we have that mindset that we're looking for them it's amazing we'll find them yeah. And yeah. that openness, I've been using the phrase a lot this year, curiosity over control. You know, when I have that control mindset, you know, often that stems from a place of fear, but I also have a fixed mindset at that point. I'm not open to what might emerge, the unexpected. And so that curiosity and creativity connection, there's a lot of linkage there. That's a, a good yeah. connection point. Yeah, I love that. Nice. So tell us, uh, MH, what other thoughts or reflections you'd like to share and how people can learn more about you, you, your work, and your upcoming book? Yeah, I know. Well, I'm sharing everything in that book. So that's that's one place. Uh, probably website is the easiest. It's uh, dr, like Dr. Marie, M-A-R-I-E hyphen Helen, H-E-L-E-N-E dot com. Oh, wonderful. We'll include that in the show notes. Wonderful. Thank- any other thoughts or reflections you'd like to share as we get ready to wrap up today? I think that the, um, I, I would in fact go back to, I think you, you've had really good questions. We've covered so many important um, concepts. I would say when I want to come back to, because so many people you work with and I work with also are so dedicated wanting to do really good work, which at times flows at times, <laughs> we're wondering <laughs> if it's gonna blow and, right and that it and and often it can one way or the other get to us a bit um, personally and so really keeping in mind that thermometer of who you are is the same read today than three months 
three years ago. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is a tough situation. We're acknowledging this and recognizing that no, it doesn't change your value as a person. So that's, a, I think, a key one because that allows many other things to flow mm -hmm. and whether it's here or somewhere else uh, better and it protects uh, your resilience so that's one point I probably want to make sure we highlight so that we keep that and then we can be part of this system in a um, really good contributing way mm -hmm. such a great point and it also helps depersonalize a challenging situation from who mm -hmm. we are as individuals and say this is a challenging moment but this you know I still have the foundational worth, value, connection, and and we're moving through a difficult time with a growth mindset, as you said earlier, to be able to consider what the, the longer term end game is. So such a great and point. the other piece I would add too is that, and if, you know, your listeners are listening to this and they're thinking, yeah, it all sounds good, but I cannot unstick myself mm -hmm. from this, then that's when you want to get it in a business, that's when we get a consultant. We're trying to do something, we've tried and it's not working, we need additional expertise, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing here. That's when we need external expertise. Get Connect with a psychologist, look into other resources you have around you because you may need someone else to help you unstick this or change the way you're looking at it or what you're doing, whatever. Change something mm -hmm. so that you uh, get unstuck. So yeah. keep that in mind as well. Absolutely. So important to, to know that resilience is built in community. And often it takes those external consultants, resources, people to help us even think about things differently and find a new way forward. So exactly. MH, thank you for such a lovely conversation today. Excited to hear more about your book when it comes out. Tell us when it is releasing. It's releasing February 6, 2024. Uh, Pre-orders in August, just six months earlier. Okay. Um, and But you can get on the list if you connect with me on the website and uh, you'll get the resilience planner if you do that. So Excellent. very friendly. Tools. That's, that's great. So thank you so much for joining MH. I appreciate it. My absolute pleasure, Christine.